One thing that I love about God's Word uh, is that it doesn't conceal, it doesn't sugarcoat, it doesn't gloss over the sinful acts of man, the consequences of their sinfulness, but especially when it's talking about the great patriarchs. You know, all those characters in the Bible we hold up in high esteem and we look to as examples and models of faith. But God's Word clearly tells us that they screwed up, didn't they? Some of them screwed up really bad. Some of them, their sin had uh, dreadful consequences. One of the examples I think we can look to most clearly, and it's, it's the man that the Scripture calls a man after God's own heart. Right? The worshiper, David, the, the great psalmist, the great king, the one who prefigures the Messiah. He messed up, didn't he? Especially when the Scripture here tells us in 2 Samuel the story of the awful consequences of David's adultery with Bathsheba. You know the story. I don't have to go over the whole thing, but... That physical act, the subsequent discovery that she was pregnant, led David to try to conceal his sin, not immediately confess it, not immediately go before the Lord, not immediately deal with his actions, but to try to hide it, to keep it secret. What does he do? He summons Bathsheba's husband Uriah from the battlefield uh, under false pretenses, and he encourages, I mean, pretty much commands Uriah, Why don't you go take this opportunity, go home and be with your wife for a while. Go cuddle with her. Wink, right? You know, in the hopes that maybe the timing is right, he impregnates her. And when the baby's born, he goes, ah, yeah, that's my son or that's my daughter, right? And no one would suspect what David and Bathsheba had done. Uriah, however, refuses His loyalty and his his sense of loyalty to the Lord first and foremost and to his king prevents him from doing that. He's like, how can I do that when the ark of the Lord and and God's people are out in battle? Here I am. I'm going to go home and be with my wife. No way. So now what does David do? The timing isn't going to work out, is it? No. Babies don't happen in a month, do they? Take a little bit longer to cook. He has Uriah killed. He has Uriah killed. He was so consumed with keeping his secret that he takes his adultery and now it becomes a murderous act. Now David wasn't interested in taking Bathsheba for a wife. She was a one night stand. She was a momentary fleeting pleasure. The consequence of of an act of not being where he was supposed to be kind of being a little slothful in his kingly activities and finds himself lusting from a rooftop. He wasn't after Bathsheba to make her his wife. He didn't want to take Uriah's wife. He wanted to hide his sin. You know, there's no no mention in the Bible that David and Bathsheba loved each other. You won't find any references there. You won't find that they had a deep and intimate relationship. I mean, it doesn't make any reference to that at all. He took her as a wife out of obligation after having her husband Killed, he makes a widow of the woman he committed adultery with who's carrying his child. But the consequences of his sinful actions are far-reaching. When you think about some of these things, what he tried to keep in secret was exposed publicly by Nathan, the prophet of the Lord. We see that God's judgment comes upon the house of David. David and Bathsheba's son dies in infancy. How horrific. David's son Amnon rapes his half-sister, Tamar, which is David's daughter. Then Tamar's brother Absalom kills David's son Amnon. Absalom then attempts to take over the kingdom. He incites civil war. And ultimately, Absalom is killed in battle. What grief and misery came upon David, but not just to David, to his whole house. And then not just to his whole house, but the entire nation of Israel. Devastating consequences. Now, our sins may not reach those kind of national levels, right? But sin has consequences for us personally, doesn't it? 
And some sins even have impact and consequences that have ripple effects and touch those closest to us and maybe even a little bit beyond. And this passage we're going to look at in Proverbs today is going to serve as as a warning shot across the bow of our hearts that these are the consequences that await us if we succumb to sexual temptation and sin sexually. It's a serious thing. This passage is going to give us a clear command, one of the clearest commands in Scripture on how to safeguard our life against sexual temptation and sin. And it's going to call to mind again the admonition that we looked at last week to ponder our paths, to consider our actions before we take actions, to be the kind of wise person that can look out ahead and see what those ripple effects might be if we go down the path of sexual sin. We're in the fifth chapter uh, chapter of Proverbs. We're going to read verses 7 through 14. Hear the words of the Lord. And now, O sons, listen to me. Do not depart from the words of my mouth. Keep your way far from her. Do not go near the door of her house. Lest you give your honor to others and your years to the merciless. Lest strangers take their fill of your strength and your labors go to the house of a foreigner. And at the end of your life, you groan. When your flesh and body are consumed and you say, how I hated discipline and my heart despised reproof. I did not listen to the voice of my teachers or incline my ear to my instructors. I am at the brink of utter ruin in the assembled congregation. These are the words of the Lord. As we looked at last week in the first part of this chapter, the central aim of this particular lesson from Solomon to his son is found in the second verse, where he says to him that that you may keep discretion and your lips may guard knowledge. Hold fast to my teaching, hold on to my instruction, don't despise it, don't forsake it, Be the wise person who keeps discretion, who holds fast to the truth, whose lips only speak what is true and comports with sound wisdom. And the motivating factor he gives for his son to do this is that he knows that his son, a young man who's going to face temptation sexually from without and from his own youthful lusts, will not stand a chance against the forbidden woman. If he doesn't keep discretion and his lips guard knowledge. Who is that forbidden woman? Well, we we talked about it. You know, this is this is the adulteress. This is the temptress, the one who could seduce the young man to sin sexually, to to disregard his father's teaching. Right. She's the rival voice uh, to the father's sound wisdom and instruction. She's the one who has honey lips. Right. Flattering lips, who who speaks what the young man wants to hear, who woos him with flirtatious and flattering talk to try to lead him off of the path of wisdom, the way of wisdom, and follow her in the path of unrighteousness. Now, the forbidden woman is, is, yes, the adulteress, but she also represents here in Solomon's teaching to his sons all manner of sexual sin. Not just adultery, not just the, the woman who could seduce him. And, and remember, he's writing to his son, a young man. Right? But, it, but it also is applicable to women as well, to our young ladies as well. Just kind of reverse the images here. And you could see if Solomon was speaking to his daughters, he would also be warning them about the immoral man, the unrighteous man, who's going to do the same thing to try to seduce them off of wisdom's path. But again, this is all manner of sexual temptation in view here. Adultery, lust, fornication, cohabitation, pornography, homosexuality, all manner of sexual sin. And before the sun is the same decision that you and I have to make every time we're faced with temptation of this nature. What are we going to do? Whose counsel are we going to follow? Whose words are we going to obey? Whose voice are we going to listen to? The voice of wisdom, the words of the sound counsel from the word of God, or our fleshly impulses and desires and the flattering words of sin? 
Whose counsel will we listen to? Now, our passage today shifts now to warning all of Solomon's sons concerning the dreadful consequences of being with a forbidden woman. No one can be with the forbidden woman, go into the forbidden woman, and come out unscathed. Come out without any consequences. In verse 7, he says, And now, O sons, again, this call for uh, obedience, initial obedience, to listen to his words, to hold fast to them, right? Listen to me. Listen to me, he says here. We have lived a longer life than our children, right? If you're a parent, you've lived a much longer life than your kids. We've walked further down this pathway of life, this road of life, and we've encountered perils and pitfalls. We've come across hindrances and obstacles. We have faced sexual temptation of varying degrees along the path. And we know these things and want to warn our children because we've encountered them. We have dealt with them. We have faced them. And many of us have not come out unscathed. Every parent wants to warn their children of perils and pitfalls. Every good parent does, right? Good parents not a good parent if they don't warn their children. That there are, there are temptations in life. There are things along the way that can trip you up so bad. It will be very difficult for you to recover from. Our life experience, brothers and sisters, is an important tool of instruction. And sometimes it's hard to share with our kids, you know, our screw-ups. But we should share those things. We should also show them how God's grace has uh, enabled us to stand up and keep walking in spite of those things. But our life experiences, when we, we've hit these perils and pitfalls as, pitfalls as our kids get older, we should be able to use them as instructions. One of the challenges of our culture today is that a lot of young people don't value age and wisdom and the life experience of their elders. But they should. They should. It's absolutely imperative especially when it comes to warnings of dangers that are ahead. What, what, what fool a person would be, right, if they're told, hey, listen, that road ends down there, and it goes off a cliff. Don't go down that path, but you're like, no, my car can fly. You know, <laughs> I'm just going to floor it and just go down that, and at the end, I'm going to leap over uh, the cavern. No, it doesn't work that way, right? That, that would be foolish to do that. So kids, pay attention to me for a moment. Listen up. Listen to your parents. Obey your parents' teachings. Obey the things that they're telling you, especially when they're warning you of dangers. Listen, there, there is stuff out there to harm you. There are things out there that can cause you to not just disobey your parents, but to disobey God and turn from God, and that will have consequences in your life. So don't dismiss your parents. It goes for our children and for our older teens. Don't dismiss your parents when they're warning you of perils and dangers and pitfalls. They know more than you do. It's a a sad thing in our culture today, but just because kids can Google things, they think they're smart and have wisdom. That doesn't bring you wisdom at all. Wisdom is a skill that is learned, that is honed, that is sharpened throughout life. And wisdom comes only from the Word of God and obeying the Word of God. Okay? So listen. Pay attention. Don't dismiss it. Don't roll your eyes. I know sometimes we as parents like to repeat things a lot. uh, But repetition is good because that's how we remember things. Listen. Obey. Heed. There is life in that. There is life in that. And this is what Solomon is doing here in warning him. Not just teaching him life lessons, not just exhorting him on the good things to do in life, but that there are things that seek to disturb him. Our children will be tempted sexually, and they're being so at a much younger age. So what do we do? We instruct and we warn And for Solomon here, he's going to provide a cautionary tale for his sons to to, to demonstrate to them the consequences if they disobey, if they go down that path. Forever, right, you know, fairy tales 
have been used as, as, as lessons to teach um, moral things and warn of consequences and, and teach life lessons to children. And some of those fairy tales can be frightening to kids. They, they contain subject matters that are strong and unsettling, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. Because fear is a pretty good motivator at times uh, for good behavior in our kids. It doesn't change the heart, but it sure can sharpen up a kid enough to say, you know what, I'm going to do what mom and dad just said because I don't want something bad to happen to me. But some of the famous ones we know, especially as they're taught nowadays, usually have happily ever, and, uh, happily ever after endings. Like they end on a really positive note, like all goes well with them. But when you look at these particular fairy tales, as they were originally written, that was not the case. They didn't have happy endings. They had pretty, pretty scary endings and dreadful endings. Think of Little Red Riding Hood. Okay? As it was written originally by Charles Perrault, the, the pretty young woman in that story was not a little girl. She was a young woman, a, a beautiful young woman. And she was uh, commissioned by her mom to take a cake that was baked for her grandmother. So she's taking the cake to her grandmother. Of course, along the way, who does she encounter? She encounters the wolf. Only she doesn't know that it's dangerous to talk to a wolf. That's a good note for us right there. Don't talk to a wolf, all right? But she doesn't know that. So she engages in, com- in conversation, right? And she tells the wolf what she's about, what she's doing. She's going to take this cake to her grandmother. And the wolf's thinking, I haven't eaten in a while. So what does he do? He runs off ahead, right, and disguises himself and pretends to be her grandmother. So when she gets there, right, he's up in the room, you know, and he calls out to her, and she's like, wow, you know, doesn't quite sound like grandma, but maybe she's sick, right? And in the original story, check this out, Little Red Riding Hood actually disrobes, takes off all of her clothes, and gets in bed with grandma. I know, that's kind of weird, but that's the story, right? And, and there, you know, she's with the disguised wolf as a grandmother, and that famous dialogue ensues from that point. My grandma, right, what big arms you have. Oh, the better to hug you with, right? What, what big ears, the better to listen to you. What big eyes, the better to see you with. What big teeth, right, uh, the better to eat you with, right? And in the story we know, she escapes and... The wolf is killed by the woodcutter, right? And her and her grandmother are rescued. But in the original, that's not what happens. She gets eaten. She doesn't make it out of this. She doesn't escape because she did a foolish thing, right? And listen to to the way that fairy tale closes with the moral of the story. Children, especially attractive, well-bred young ladies, should never talk to strangers. For if they should do so... They may well provide dinner for a wolf. I say wolf, but there are various kinds of wolves. There are also those who are charming, quiet, polite, unassuming, complacent, and sweet, who pursue young women at home and in the streets. And unfortunately, it is, it is these gentle wolves who are the most dangerous ones of all. Not a bad lesson, right? <laughs> it's a pretty darn good lesson, right? A cautionary tale for young girls to avoid these kind of men. This is what Solomon is doing here, providing a cautionary tale, teaching them a life lesson as, here's what happens if you go down the path of the forbidden woman. Now, before getting to the moral of the story here, he gives a stern command uh, to his sons on how to deal with sexual temptation, how to safeguard themselves from the forbidden woman. Look what he says in verse 8. Keep Your way far from her. Do not go near the door of her house. Keep your way far from her. Do not go near the door of her house. What is he saying? Stay away. away. Keep away. Don't get caught in the wrong place with the wrong person at the wrong time so that you don't do the wrong things. The only way to avoid the forbidden woman with the honey lips, with the flattering words that seeks to seduce you, is to stay as far away as possible from her as you can. Do not go near her door. That's pretty clear, isn't it? I don't think we need to study the original language here. I don't think we need to parse words and verbs and try to understand grammatical structure here. No, it's pretty clear. Stay away. 
Why? Well, Solomon knows the biological drives of, of young men, their impulses, their urges, and that if these drives aren't kept in their proper boundaries, it will lead to sexual sin and the consequences that follow. Now, to be clear, sexual desire, brothers and sisters, is a good thing. Amen? We shouldn't be ashamed of that. It's a good thing in its proper context, exercised in the proper place that God designed for it to be in a monogamous monogamous marriage. One man and one woman for life. That's God's design. And Solomon knows this, even though Solomon obviously did not heed his own counsel to his own peril. But youthful desires like that and youthful lusts, if not kept in check, will lead to immoral behavior and incur the dreadful consequences of those actions. So the best way to avoid that, the best way is to not put before you the very thing that can seduce you away from wisdom's way. Now that seems obvious. We are all like, duh, yeah, that makes sense. Just stay away from it. Yet we don't. Many of us don't. The best way to avoid temptation to sin is to not be anywhere near the thing that can draw you into that sin. It's an example. If your flirtatious co-worker is causing you to lust in your heart and entertain ungodly things towards that person and to be unfaithful to your spouse and you enjoy his or her flirtiness and flattering talk, you are going and knocking on the door of sexual sin. You're not avoiding. You're not staying as far away. You are getting as close to the line as possible, hoping that you don't get burned. You cannot flirt with temptation, get as close to the line as possible without crossing it, and expect to come out unscathed. This is common sense, but you do not overcome temptation if you entertain temptation just doesn't work. Do not go near the door of her house. Now, in chapter 7, Solomon tells his sons another story of a naive young man who is ensnared after flirting with temptation. So look at these verses in Proverbs chapter 7, verses 6 through 9. For at the window of my house, I have looked out through my lattice, and I have seen among the simple. Now, remember, the simple, they're not the fools, and they're not the wise. The simple are the ignorant. The simple are the unlearned. The simple are the ones who, who really are, have, have to grow in wisdom. There, there is a point where they can still be taught. They're teachable, but they can easily go after the way of folly if they're not disciplined, Right? He saw among the simple, I have perceived among the youths, a young man lacking sense, a bonehead, passing along the street near her corner. Who's her? It's the adulteress, right? The forbidden woman taking the road to her house in the twilight, in the evening, at the time of night and darkness. Take note of what he says there. This, how this senseless young man puts himself in temptation's path. Doesn't keep his way far from her. Does, doesn't go anywhere near her door. He, he does the opposite, right? He flirts with sexual temptation by doing what? Turning his feet down the path that goes to her house. Making sure to go close to the street corner, right? And when's he doing this? What time of day is he doing this? At night, right? In the darkness. Now, my mama told me nothing good happens after dark, right? (laughs) Just nothing good, right? That's what he's doing. Wrong place, wrong time, about to do the wrong thing, right? And the trap has been set, but it's by his own doing. You're going to blame the adulteress here? You're going to blame the forbidden woman? No, he's, he's making sure he's going to have that encounter by all of his actions, by not keeping far away from her. It's interesting that the very same instruction we see here from Solomon to his son is echoed in various passages throughout the New Testament. Look at 2 Timothy 2.22. This is Paul's instruction to a young man. He says to him, So flee youthful passions. Flee youthful 
passions. Well, I think that's an important thing here, isn't it? Flee youthful passions. Nobody's going to say, pray away youthful passions. Youthful passions are youthful lusts. Declare and decree away youthful lusts. No, he says, you don't stand the chance. You need to go. Flee. Run as fast as you can. Lust here, temptation here. You're, like, you're in the opposite direction. That's what you do. You don't entertain it. You don't try to get as close to it as possible. You flee. You flee. You flee. Paul doesn't tell Timothy again, hey, give him a whole list of other things. Flee. Look again, 1 Corinthians 6.18. The same thing he tells the church at Corinth there. Flee from sexual immorality. Flee. Run. Jesus goes a step further with drastic measures that one is to take when tempted to sexual sin. Matthew 5, 27 through 30. It bears for us to read this here. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. All right, so we see already it's the heart motivation, not the, the outward manifestation and action that is the actual uh, genesis of the sin. It, is, it begins in the heart, right? So here, what do you do? If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body go into hell. Those are pretty severe measures. Is this to be taken literally? Don't be scared. Is he telling you to pluck your eye out? Cut your hand off? I don't know. Maybe that's necessary in some cases. But that's not the point, is it? Because the sin is a matter of the heart, right? And it manifests itself through what you see and what you do and what you touch... You need to do everything possible to make sure your eye isn't looking upon that thing and your hands aren't touching what they're not supposed to be touching. Drastic measures. Sin doesn't sneak up on us, does it? It doesn't. We want it. We desire it. And we'll go after it. And like David, we will scheme and plot and plan and do things and then try to hide our sin and keep it from discovery and disclosure. But we want it. We put ourselves in the path of sexual temptation. So men and women who have a porn problem, yet any chance they can be on that computer, they are. No safeguards, no accountability. Again, lusting after a co-worker. So we make sure to pass by their cubicle every day, several times a day, in the hopes that we can engage them in conversation. There's that scantily clad gym bunny that has caught our attention, so we make sure that our you know, workout schedules coincide so that we can encounter them every time. We don't curb our entertainment habits, so we watch sexually suggestive material and content that provokes us to lust and sin. There's ladies who can't put down those, those romance fantasy novels, right? And so they're desiring to be in a relationship with a man like the one they're reading. And they know it's wrong, but they don't put those things down. We don't avoid the things that trip us up to our sexual sin. Romans thirteen fourteen. Paul says, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Make no provision for the flesh, to gratify its desires. No provision. No provision for the flesh. Don't make plans to gratify the sinful desires of your flesh. Do you get the picture of what Solomon's teaching and what the New Testament writers and our Lord is teaching us here? Right? We can easily be seduced and go down this path if we put ourselves in the path. Of sexual temptation. The best way is to avoid it altogether. Put the safeguards in your life. So you don't go down there. You stay as far away as possible. 
Keep away from the source of what entices you. Think about that. Think about the practical implications for some who struggle in this area continually, who continually succumb to sexual temptation. Some of you may need to change some rhythms of life to keep away from sexual temptation. Some of you may need to change your job. Some of you may need to delete some apps from your phones and devices. Some of you may need to delete phone numbers. Some of you may need to put accountability software on your devices and browsers. Some of you may need to break with a set of friends and stop hanging out with them. Some of you may not be able to go to certain places, watch certain shows or certain movies because they entice you to sexual sin. It's that serious. The warning is that serious. Keep away from the sources of sexual temptation. Don't darken the door. Don't set your feet down that path. Keep your way far from it. It's a strong, strong exhortation from God's word. And like a good parent warning their child of the dangers, we need to heed that, brothers and sisters. Let not a single one of us in this room think we are immune from going down that path and not guard our hearts and not guard ourselves and watch over ourselves. That goes for our young men and our young women here. To guard your heart. Yeah, you're not married right now. But again, remember, this isn't just about adultery. This is about all sexual sin. We are exhorted and commanded in God's word to be pure to be blameless, to guard our hearts, to be holy as He is holy. And yes, we, we're going to talk about the implications of the gospel shortly here, but that doesn't mean we just, oh, Jesus did everything for me. I'm just going to cruise control my life here and think that this stuff isn't going to hit us or this stuff isn't going to hit our kids because they come to church and we have family worship time. We are all going to deal with this and face with it. And the Scripture tells us very clearly Keep away from it. That's the best solution. Let's look at the consequences then of sexual sin. Because 9 through 14 here, the remainder of that passage is is what happens to the person who doesn't keep uh, watch of their life, who, who doesn't keep their way far from the forbidden woman and who ends up approaching her door. So if the father's counsel is ignored, if his counsel is despised, rejected, uh, this is what's going to be the outcome. This is what's going to happen. And so the father's saying to the son here, here's how your life is going to be ruined because you forsook my counsel and departed from my wisdom and instruction. Now, the, count, the consequences that he's going to present here are multi-layered, right? They're, 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 they're consequences kind of like David's that impacted all of his life and even beyond his own. You're going to see temporal consequences and ultimately eternal consequences for uh, the impenitent. There are material and social consequences. There are emotional and physical consequences and impacts because there is something about sexual sin that has much deeper effects than all other sins. Oh yeah, are all sins equally bad? Yeah. Are all sins equally condemning? Yes, right, if they're not repented of. But not all sins have the same consequences. They don't. And Scripture tells us that sexual sin has a far deeper impact and effect than all other sins that are outside the body. We don't have time to go in that today, but we will in a future teaching here. So the consequences of sexual sin are vast. It's a larger rock dropped in the pond with larger ripple effect than some other sins in our life. And and Solomon does not present here a pretty picture of the consequences. So let's look first as the the temporal consequences. And those uh, negative consequences are introduced by that word lest, right? Lest, right? These are the negative consequences of not obeying the Father's command. And he mentions four types of people here who are going to meet out four types of consequences that this young man is going to face for going down the path of folly here. In verse 9, he says, lest you give your honor to others 
and your years to the merciless, right? So he has others and the merciless there. There's two types of people there. And verse 10, lest strangers take their fill of your strength and your labors go to the house of a foreigner. Now, it's interesting. It's others and strangers and foreigners. So this indicates that it's not really people in his inner circle, right? These are people that really he's not maybe even in relationship with, in communication with, but they are going to mete out certain types of consequences for his infidelity. And Solomon makes it clear here that the son is the one who ignores his counsel and thus is personally responsible for all of these terrible consequences that will befall him. Look how he says there, lest you give your honor. This is something you're doing here. Well, the consequences are coming your way from others, but it's you first, right? You gave your honor to others. You gave your years to the merciless, right? So personal responsibility, personal culpability there. Now, Solomon has a keen awareness of the impact of his sexual sin. And we've talked a little bit about that in the past. Uh, But his sin, like David's, impacted the entire nation of Israel. And any sexual sin has these kind of far-reaching impacts that go beyond your life. And they affect those closest to us, especially that of adultery. Now, these four types of people are going to inflict these kind of things here uh, because of adultery with a forbidden woman. She's forbidden, once again, just as a reminder, because she's someone else's wife. She's not yours. She's off limits to you. She doesn't belong to you. She belongs to someone else. Now, in the ancient culture of this time, uh, there was uh, uh, grievances here that could be solved in a number of ways uh, when this kind of infraction, this kind of sin of adultery was committed. For instance, the jealous husband of the adulterous wife could demand some type of monetary recompense from the, from the man who committed adultery with his wife. He could demand a certain payment for that. And that would be brought up before the, the elders of the community, the village. They'd, they'd sit at the gate. They'd, they'd adjudicate uh, a legal proceeding here and say, he's guilty, has to pay X amount. There's even some cases in antiquity here where, again, this jealous husband of the woman who committed adultery could now take that individual, that man who committed adultery with his wife, and make him his slave for life. And there's nothing that man could do to pay his way out of that kind of servitude. Like, those are severe consequences. But we don't have to go far but look in the Mosaic law that has provisions for stoning to death in cases of adultery. That's how serious this sin was for God's people. You commit adultery, you're liable to be stoned to death. Serious consequences. Now, in Proverbs 6, again, another little bit lengthy passage here, but I want us to to read it, at least to read it here, shows some of these economic and punitive consequences. Proverbs 6, 26 through 35. Verse 26, for the price of a prostitute is only a loaf of bread. Now, he's not saying prostitution's okay. Hey, don't commit adultery, but this one's okay because she's not married. That's not what's going on here at all. But rather, the, the consequence is less severe than if she were married and you commit adultery. But a married woman hunts down a precious life. Can a man carry fire next to his chest and his clothes not be burned? Can a man walk on hot coals and his feet not be scorched? So is he who goes to his neighbor's wife. None who touches her will go unpunished. You see that? People do not despise a thief if he steals to satisfy his appetite when he's hungry. But if he's caught, he will pay sevenfold. He will give all the goods of his house. He who commits adultery lacks sense. He who does it destroys himself. He will get wounds and dishonor. And his disgrace will not be wiped away. For jealousy makes a man furious. And he will not spare when he takes revenge. He will accept no compensation. He will refuse, though you multiply gifts. That's harsh, isn't it? This is what's going to happen to the man who's, who, who's unfaithful and commits adultery with another man's wife, right? When that jealous husband seeks revenge, he is going to exact everything 
from this unfaithful man. That man will be financially ruined by the jealous husband. Everything that that man worked hard to attain and achieve and labor for is going to be taken from him. He's going to have wounds and pain inflicted on him at the hands of the merciless. The shame and the consequences of his sin are are not going to go away quickly at all. They're going to last for a very long time. His disgrace will not be wiped away. And all of this is self-inflicted punishment for getting involved with an adulterous woman. That's how severe sexual sin is. That's how severe the sin of adultery is as well. Devastating consequences. Now, in our culture, you commit adultery, you might face the fury of a jealous husband, and sure, he can go after you and hurt you and kill you and do something physically to you. You're probably not going to be made a slave. Maybe. I don't know. Other parts of the world, that might be the case here. But we know that adultery has devastating consequences, doesn't it? When infidelity, adultery, and sometimes ensuing divorce hits marriages, the impact of that sin is monumental. Families are ripped apart. There is emotional and psychological devastation. Their livelihoods are affected. Spiritual impacts, shame, regret, trust is lost. The marital covenant broken. Reputations are ruins. Sometimes jobs are lost. Relationships exit your life at rapid levels. If you claim to be a believer, right, you're you're no longer a believer who's above reproach. Your your testimony is worthless. There could be physical consequences in the form of, of STDs. Awful consequences for sexual sin and adultery. Solomon is painting this cautionary tale in the most graphic uh, ways as possible because sexual sin robs you in so many different ways. It will take more from you than the momentary fleeting pleasures you may experience. It'll exact more from you. It'll cost you more than you ever wanted to pay. Some of you have walked through that. Some of you have experienced this kind of devastation and may still be reeling from it. And maybe you can share that story with others who may need to hear it. But this warning is here for us in Scripture for a reason. That we're to flee from it, we're to avoid it. And we're to ponder our paths so that we don't end up like this. Verse 11, he says, and at the end of your life, you groan. The end of your life, you groan. This, this, is a, this is the portrait of a man in ad, advanced years of his life living with regret as his body is being consumed and wasted away. Bruce Walke in his commentary writes that this is a cry of anguish from extreme destitution and exhaustion and represents a payday situation when regret and remorse come too late. Not a good thing. Not a good picture to be at the end of your life and now you're like, I wish I hadn't done that. Oh, how I could have spared myself of so much pain and misery and spared my family and others of so much pain and misery. If only I had listened to sound wisdom and counsel and instruction. But look here, what does he say? How I hated discipline and my heart despised reproof. Now, we've spent some time already with this this theme of discipline and its importance and and how we discipline our children because we love them, right? They may not like it, and we as adults may not like discipline at times, and we know the Lord disciplines those whom He loves. He disciplines His children. He disciplines us for holiness and for righteousness. It's not always pleasant. It's kind of painful at times. It hurts to walk through it and go through it. But it's necessary and it's important and we need to learn to embrace it as a a part of life because it's God working in us to sanctify us and grow us in wisdom. Grow us in the skill of living rightly. But here he's saying that he hated discipline. This son hated discipline. He had no taste for wisdom. He had no taste for understanding, for sound counsel, for spiritual matters. No taste for heavenly things. He rejects All of these things. 
He's a fool. He's an absolute fool. This is what Proverbs 12.1 says. Whoever loves discipline loves knowledge, but he who hates reproof is stupid. Yeah, kids, don't say that word. But there's a right context for it, and it's this person who hates discipline, who hates reproof, who hates correction, despises instruction and sound wisdom. Again, we don't naturally like it, but as we mature, as we grow in wisdom, we come to love discipline because it produces in us the fruit of righteousness, the fruit of holiness, and the wisdom of the Lord. When we reject sound counsel and throw ourselves headlong into our sin and our folly, we are demonstrating that we hate sound counsel and wisdom. And this person here says, I didn't listen to the voice of my teachers. I didn't bend my ear. I didn't incline my ear to listen to my instructors. So he's, he's guilty here. Because this is not ignorance. He can't say, oh, mama and papa never taught me. Oh, if only they would have told me and warned me. Then he might be off the hook a little bit here. But he can't because he heard it. He listened to it, but he didn't heed it. He despised it. He rejected it. So We have to think about this ourselves. Are we the people who seek wise counsel and listen to it? Do we heed it? Or do we hate it and despise it? See, the wise person is not the one who seeks counsel after they've blown it. After they've gone and done the thing they should not have done. No, the wise person seeks counsel before they take action. That's what a wise person does. A fool doesn't do that. Or are you the kind of person who bristles when someone corrects you and confronts you? Do you get defensive and dismissive? Do you begin to attack the person who's, who's bringing you correction? That might be someone close to you who loves you and is for you, but they're, they're bringing something to you that maybe you don't want to hear, right? The Word's telling us here, if, if, if you despise that, if you reject that, you're an idiot. You're a fool. You're stupid. Be the kind of person who receives discipline from the Lord and from godly people. And from godly parents and godly teachers. The despiser of the discipline here says in verse 14 that he's recognized uh, here that he is in utter ruin in the assembled congregation. There's a lot of debate on necessarily what does that mean, the assembled congregation. But the point is that his infidelity was not kept secret. He may have tried to hide it, right? But it's out. It's public knowledge right now possibly be brought before the leaders of the community here, and they're bringing judgment. And his adultery brings, brings about personal shame and humiliation uh, to his loved ones, a loss of respect uh, in the larger community. I mean, these consequences are set forth here for us as a reminder that sexual sin has serious consequences. It's not just a personal offense It ruins families, it ruins relationships, it ruins careers, it has ruined churches. And in some cases, like we see in God's word, it's ruined nations. Here's the reality. There are those temporal consequences uh, of sexual sin, uh, and we, we might be shrewd enough to keep it hidden, right? Keep it from our spouse, keep it from other people, hide our indiscretions, Our sins. We may avoid some of the more devastating consequences in this life, uh, but the scripture is clear we do not avoid final judgment. We don't escape the eternal consequences. The end of chapter 5, verses 21 23, Solomon writes, For man's ways are before the eyes of the Lord, and he, the Lord, ponders all his paths. The iniquities of the wicked ensnare him, and he is held fast in the cords of his sin. He dies for lack of discipline, and because of his great folly, he is led astray. We can hide our sin from others. We can't hide it from the Lord. Nothing is hidden. Nothing escapes his penetrating gaze. 
The Lord ponders all of the paths of a man's ways. Earlier, that's what we were exhorted to do, right? Ponder the paths of your way. Pay attention, right? Look out ahead. God's also observing our ways and pondering our paths. And our secret sins are not a secret to Him. The one who doesn't repent of their sins, the one who doesn't turn to Christ and have their sins washed away by His blood, is not only in bondage to their sins, it will lead to their ultimate destruction. The lack of discipline will destroy that person in the end. Sexual sin will drag you to hell. Bring it to the light, brothers and sisters. Don't be ensnared by it. Don't remain in bondage to it any longer. Confess your sins to the Lord. Turn to Christ for salvation and forgiveness, brothers and sisters. These eternal consequences are real. They're real. I'm going to leave you, though, with a word of hope. I know that's heavy. Those warnings are severe and serious, and we don't ignore them. We're not going to gloss over them. I'm not going to sugarcoat them for us because God's word doesn't. These consequences are very real. But there is good news for us. There's hope for overcoming sexual temptation. Not just obeying that one clear command to flee from it, which we must do. Paul, writing to the church at Corinth, makes it clear that all manners of sexual sin will disinherit a person from the kingdom of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 9, and 10. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. That is the bleak outlook for those who continue in sexual immorality and sexual sin, right? If we don't repent of them, if we don't turn to Christ and we continue down this path, We don't inherit the kingdom of God. It's clear. It's clear. But look at what follows this list. Because Paul is saying, this is true. Go down that path. Continue down that path. I keep identifying with those kind of sexual sins. Here's the outcome. It's not the kingdom of God. It's not heaven. It's not the glories. Uh, uh, of the spiritual realm with Jesus Christ for eternity. But here's the present reality of the believer. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 11. He says, And such were some of you. I love that phrase. And such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ And by the Spirit of our God. Isn't that awesome? Isn't that awesome, right? This is what you used to be, brothers and sisters. You were all those things and more, right? You are dirty, rotten, filthy, wretched. Son of a guns. Unrighteous, right? Just filth, right? The worst of the worst. There's no way you can inherit the kingdom of God. That's what you were, but that's not what you are now. You were washed. Look at this past tense action here. Christ's work. You were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified. That's your present reality. That is your identity right now. Washed, sanctified, justified by Christ and by His Spirit. You're not just sinners. I mean, because we could hear these things and hear these warnings and be left with this crushing weight of That's all we are is just sinners. How am I ever going to overcome this? I'm consumed by it. It, 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 It's hard for me to avoid it. We're not just sinners. God's word declares to us we're also saints. That's what we are. We're washed. We're sanctified. We're justified. We are saints. I love, that's how Paul greets, right? In In his writings to the churches, he greets who? The saints. Hagios in the Greek, holy ones. Hello, holy ones. Hello, saints of God. This is what he's saying in his greetings to them. Martin Luther wrote of this particular truth in a Latin phrase that he has made well known. Simul justus et peccator. It's a Latin phrase that means simultaneously just or righteous 
and sinner. A reality that we kind of both inhabit sometimes in the same way. We are still encased in this flesh, right? We still sin. We still have the, the capacity to sin, the ability to sin. We do sin. We practice sin. But for the Christian, the one who's, who, who's had the righteousness of Christ imputed to them, they're righteous before God. So they no longer identify with their sin. They no longer identify with the things that they used to be. They are in Christ Jesus. Righteous, holy, sanctified, fully justified before God because of Christ Jesus. That is the essence of the gospel. So don't be left here just like in the dirt. If you're struggling with sexual sin, if you're struggling with temptation of any sort, I want you to lift your gaze up because the scripture says, guess where we are right now? We are seated in the heavenly places with Christ Jesus. That's where we are. We rule and reign with him in some spiritual degree and capacity now because we are in Christ. And where is Christ? He's on his throne. He is ruling and reigning his universe. And we need to get this view of who we are in him more than anything else. We heed the warnings. We we obey those warnings. We know they're real. But I want you to be caught up with a far greater superior pleasure and affection in Christ Jesus and what Christ Jesus has done for us rather than these inferior things that we deal with here on earth and the struggles that we go through in our flesh. Yeah, we're still sinners to one degree or another. That's not going to end until that day. We're never going to be sinless. It's just not going to happen. To be sinless means you're not here anymore. If you're sinless, you're dead, right? Fully dead. You're with the Lord, all right? But we should be sinning less, yes, over time. But we're saints. We're saints of God. You may not think of yourself that way. You you may be more kind of inward focused of, of... the sin you're walking through, the temptation you continually struggle with, that it's hard for you to think of yourself this way. But that's who God says you are in Christ. That's who you are. Positionally before God, that is who we are, holy and righteous because of Christ's work on our behalf. Let's be more focused on that. Let's be more focused on living out of that righteous identity and reality. We are saints. We are saints. I want to live up to that. And in Christ, because of his spirit, we can. We can. Sin is no longer our master. We're no longer slaves to sin, right? We sing that song, right? No longer a slave. Well, act like it. Live like it because you're a saint of God. That is the greatest motivator to resist all temptation and to live lives pleasing to God, brothers and sisters. So once again, where do you want you to look? Look to Christ. Look to our Redeemer. Look to our Savior who's made us righteous in Him.